1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is one of those classic passages in the New Testament on the subject of what we call the rapture. There are not many passages that really refer to what we term the rapture. One of which is this passage. Another one is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And a third one is a very early one. It's in the Gospels. The Gospel of John, it's from the lips of Jesus, John 14 and uh, verses 2 and 3. But this is the most information that we get in our Bible on what is called the rapture. And when you read the New Testament, you realize that uh, these early New Testament believers held vigorously to Jesus not only coming back, but coming back at any time. He could come back at any moment. They believed that. In fact, Paul indicates it and others that he they were expecting him to come back even during their own lifetime. And as a result, it was a powerful motivation for them to live holy lives, for them to live lives that are separated to God and not live selfishly for themselves. These new believers in the church in Thessalonia, they knew that Jesus was coming back. Paul had informed them. He was only there a few months, but he had informed them, and they knew that, and they believed that, but the thing that concerned them was not that Jesus was going to come back, but what about the people that they knew and loved among their own family members or the church family? What about those that they were believers, but they have already died? What's going to happen to them when Jesus does come back? That was their main question. Well, in verses 13 to 18, he answers that. He gives the answer to that question, and it's great instruction that he gives, and it also results in some incredible hope that he stirs up in these people, but also in us. You know, another name for the rapture is taken from Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, which that also is a verse referring to the rapture. It's called the blessed hope. It is a blessed hope. It is a hope because it is a promise of God. And we know that all the promises of God are ironclad. They are totally guaranteed. If God promises it, guess what? It is going to happen. In fact, God stakes the person of Jesus on his promises. He says all the promises of God are accumulated in Christ. And in Christ, they are all positive. They are yea, they're yes, and amen, which means so be it. Now, this is a great promise that we have here in these verses that we've read this morning. He lays down some certainties, and then he gives us the components of what we call the rapture. And then that issues in some very wonderful comforts that result from it. Before we actually look at these verses, let's pause a moment once again, and let's pray together, shall we? Our Father, thank you for giving us this instruction. This is light, and it's wondrous light. Thank you for this revelation that you have set forth here in this portion of your word, the scripture. It gives us such hope. We have a future. This life isn't all there is. There's more to come, and what's, what's to come is incomparable with what we have now. It's a blessed hope, and we thank you for that. That blessed hope of the any moment coming of the great God who is our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Oh, we praise you for that. We ask that he would be praised, that he would have preeminence. We ask that you would you would anoint both the lips and the ears, both the one who speaks and the one who listens, that 
Holy Spirit enablement would be given both that your purpose for your word that is studied today would be fulfilled. We just thank you ahead of time and ask it all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, let's look at verses 13 and 14 as we begin. And so I'll read it again. He said, but I would not have you to be ignorant. The word ignorant there is the word that we get our word agnostic from. I don't want you to be an agnostic. In other words, to be an agnostic is someone that doesn't know whether there's a God. They think, well, there may be, but I don't know that for sure. Well, Paul is not talking about knowing whether or not there's a God, but when he uses that term, he says, I don't, I, I want you to know positively about this matter that we call the rapture. I don't want there to be any doubts about it. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to know. And he calls them brethren. I want you to know concerning them which are asleep. I like that term for death, don't you? Asleep. You know, when people are asleep, you don't worry because you know that eventually they're going to wake up. Well, that's the term that the Holy Spirit of God has chosen. And I think it was Jesus that actually coined that term for death. Remember, there was a, a young girl that had died, and Jesus goes to raise her, to resuscitate her out of death, and he says to the people that are mourning, what, what's all the commotion? She's sleeping. And they laughed him to scorn, right? And then remember when Lazarus died, and Jesus uh, tells his disciples, uh, you know, we are going to visit Lazarus and his sisters now. Um, Lazarus is asleep. And the disciples think, well, he's asleep. You know, what's the big deal? He was sick, but now he's asleep, so everything's good. But Jesus was speaking of the fact that Lazarus had died. And so Paul picks up on that same terminology that I guess I could say Jesus coined. And he tells us that death for a believer is a sleep. It's not a sleep of your soul. You know, the Bible says, and Paul gives us this information very clearly, when a believer dies, what happens? The Bible says that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The moment a believer in Christ dies, their soul and their spirit is ushered into the presence of the Lord. But their body is what sleeps. Their body sleeps in the grave, so to speak. Their body is dead, but their soul and their spirit is consciously alive in God's presence. And that's the hope that we have. So he uses that terminology that you are not ignorant concerning them which believers who have died in Christ, you might say who have passed away in Christ. Why does he want them to know this? He says, verse 13, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. Now, it's very clear <laughs> that when we lose someone that we love, we ought to grieve. We ought to sorrow. It ought to bring sorrow. It's natural. It's a human emotion that God created us with. But notice the emphasis here in verse 13. He's not saying don't sorrow, don't grieve when a loved one dies, but he's saying your grief as a believer who has lost another believer through physical death, your sorrow is much, much different than the sorrow of this world. You know, the pagan world, which, by the way, the world's always been pagan. It was pagan in Paul's day. That Greco-Roman world and culture was pagan. Our world is pagan. In fact, they call our culture neo-paganism. That is a new form of paganism. It's just old paganism, uh, you know, revived, you might say. So 
the pagan world, they ha they offer no hope of life after death. You name it. All the re world religions, they have no certainty of life after death. And if they do, it doesn't come anywhere near the kind of life after death that we have given to us here in the scripture. So Christian, Christian grief is different from the world's grief because we have a certainty of a life after death. And the reason we have that is not only because it's written in the word of God, but because our human spirits are joined to the person of Jesus who died and rose again. And we know that his resurrection guarantees our resurrection. Going back to Lazarus' death again. His sister Martha, when she hears that Jesus is in the village, she runs to meet him and she says to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus says, he will rise again. And she says, I know, I know, I know that in the last days, there is going to be a resurrection. And you know what Jesus says to her? He looks her in the eye and he says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. In saying that, he is, he is redirecting her attention from an event, a day in the future called the resurrection, to a person who himself is the resurrection and the life. It's not an event, it's a person. And so he says to us in verse 14, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus, that is, Believers that have passed away in Christ will God bring with him. So he ties the certainty of life after death to the fact that Jesus rose again. He died and rose again. He is the resurrection and the life. The certainty regarding the future of dead believers or us as living believers, all the certainties are bound up in a person, are bound up in Christ. And that's the truth that he's trying to communicate. Now, you can be certain that there's life after death if you start at this first step. The start of life after death is this. There is no hope until you as an individual have come to the cross, until you personally have trusted Jesus Christ and what he's done for you on that cross when he bled and died and suffered your punishment fully in your place as your sin bearer, as your substitute, there's no hope of life after death until you come into that personal saving relationship with him by believing, that is, by receiving him as your Savior. There is life after death that is connected with the cross of Christ because the cross of Christ is followed by the resurrection, and that is the guarantee of the believer's resurrection. And this truth that we're going to be studying this whole day called the rapture. It starts with salvation. So you need to ask yourself, whether you're here in person or whether you uh, hear, uh, are hearing this over the internet, you need to ask yourself, have I ever come to the cross? Have I ever trusted Jesus as my Savior? Because if you haven't, there's no guarantee of life after. There's no hope really for you. That's where it starts. But also, I want you to see the source here. Look at verse 14 again, where he uses this phraseology, them which sleep in Jesus. See that? Them which sleep in Jesus. The word, that, that preposition, I am, in. Them that sleep in Jesus 
could perhaps be better understood them that sleep through Jesus. That is, their death is turned to sleep through Jesus. Death isn't uh, the, the evil monster. For the believer, death is turned to sleep through Jesus, is what he's saying there. Death is a temporary a temporary state regarding the body. Through Jesus, you have all the hope, all the certainty, because resurrection and rapture are certain. How do we know that Jesus died and rose again? How do we know it? Well, we know it obviously because that's what the Bible teaches. That's what the Bible says. But are you aware of this fact? that perhaps the, the, the most historically attested fact in human history is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Are you aware of that? Not just the Bible, but it's backed up by historical fact. And so what he's saying here is that our certainty of a resurrection and a rapture is just as certain as Jesus's historical death and resurrection. Because of that historical fact, there is a certainty, there is a guarantee that believers will have a resurrection and living believers at that moment will have a rapture. We'll talk about what that means. But let me just say this. There's an interesting verse that Paul gives us at the end of his life. 2 Timothy is Paul's last writing. He is about to be martyred for Christ. And he says in that uh, fourth chapter, he said, I'm ready to be offered. <laughs> I finished my course. I fought a good fight. And then he says, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And then he says, that crown of righteousness, that reward is not for me only, but he says, for all those who love his appearing. Your love of the any moment appearing of Jesus is really proportioned to your love for Jesus himself. If you love him, if your heart is fixed on him, you're going to love his appearing. You're going to be longing for it. You're going to be looking for it. The reason believers do not look for and long for the appearing of Jesus is because they really don't love him very much. They don't love him enough. The thing that sustains these certainties that Paul is giving us in the 13th and 14th verse about the resurrection of believers that have fallen asleep in Christ or died in Christ is that it's in him. It's bound up in him. And when your heart is fixed on him, your love is appearing. That's what sustains it, our love for him. Now, let's look a little closer in verses 15 to 17 having just talked about the certainties of this resurrection, let's look at the components of the resurrection and the rapture, because that's what the next three verses are all about, 15, 16, 17. Remember, Paul is answering a vital question for these people. And the question isn't that Jesus is coming. They knew that and they believed that. And the question is, are we, uh, is not, are we going to be with Jesus? They knew that, they believed that. The question, the main question he's answering is, well, what happens to believers who have died before Jesus does return? What happens to them? Maybe you have a, a similar question in your own mind. What happens to believers that die before Jesus returns for his church? Because obviously some in the church at, at Thessalonia had already died 
or they wouldn't be questioning that. When will the dead be raised? That's the question. And he answers those questions beginning in verse 15. And notice how he does so. He says in, in the 15th verse, For this we say unto you by the word of God. Don't overlook what he's saying there. What he's telling us is, I have received this instruction that I'm about to share with you directly from the Lord himself. This is direct revelation from God that is being shared with us here. That's, that's exciting. That's important. And what he does share is really hope. Hope of a glorious future. Belief in a, in a, in a rapture that is, can I use this word, imminent. Imminent. I-M-M-I-N-E-N-T. Imminent. What does imminent mean? Imminent means something that an event or something that can happen at any time, at any moment. And this is what he's going to reveal to them. And that when Jesus returns, believers that have died before he returns, they're going to be given priority. Don't worry about it. They're going to be given priority. Look at what he says. Again, going back to verse 15, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not, now the King James Version says prevent, a word that would be uh, probably better understood by us today because words change over years is the word precede. We which are alive and remain shall not precede them which are asleep. That is, that believers who have died in Christ before Jesus returns will be given priority when he does return. They'll be given special priority. Well, what is that? The Lord himself, see verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend. He's not merely going to send angels. He's not going to send uh, others to take his place. But the Lord himself, and that's the emphasis of that 16th verse, that it is a personal return by Jesus. The Lord himself will usher in a momentous event with three separate but almost simultaneous, forceful, dramatic announcements from the sky of his return. What are they? Let's look at it. Verse 16, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, first of all, notice that, with a shout. With a shout. That word shout is a word that refers to a military command. He, Jesus himself, will descend with a shout, with a military command, like a, a, a drill sergeant that says, forward, march. And you know what it reminds me of? In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, is about seven ancient churches in what today is modern Turkey, the seven churches of Asia Minor. That's what the first three chapters are all about. And that's the ones who are the recipient of the book. When you get to verse one of chapter four, John is told, come up hither, come up hither. And there is not a word about a church in four, five, six, seven, all the way through to the end of the book. Until there is mention in chapter 19 of Jesus' second coming and an army on white horses with him, and after that, a, a, or before that, a wedding feast. 
what is that? What am I saying? I'm saying the church is not revealed in that 70th week of Daniel that is pictured in chapter 4 to chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Because I think it's hinted in the fact when John hears that voice from heaven saying, come up hither, that to me is a picture of the, of the rapture. And perhaps that's the command that is going to be heard when the Lord himself descends and, and shouts, gives a military command. Perhaps that command will be to his church, come up hither. But notice something else in verse 16. Not only will there be a shout, but they will be the voice of the archangel. In the scripture, there is only one archangel that is ever mentioned, and that is Michael. And so it appears that uh, it's his voice, the voice of Michael the archangel. Now, notice where this is taking place. This is taking place in the air. Verse 17, I just want to show this to you. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. See that? To meet the Lord in the air. Do you realize that Satan is called in Ephesians chapter 2, the prince and power of the, air. of the air. And I think it's significant that there is this voice of the archangel. If you look in Daniel chapter 10, there is a struggle, there is a warfare that is going on between Michael and his angels and uh, the wicked one, and his forces in the heavens, in the air. The air, the surrounding atmosphere, is the region, is the location of our enemy. He's the prince and power of the air. Oh, yes, he's the god of this world, too. But his location, the region where he operates from, because he's unseen, He's a, an evil spirit, and those that work with him are evil spirits. They live in the unseen realm in the air. And so in the air, there is this voice of the archangel. While Jesus' shout is a command, this voice of the archangel, I think, is one of conquest. He is speaking right in the region of Satan's powerful headquarters in the air. That's where Michael's shout comes, and I think the shout is a shout of conquest. I think it is a voice that is announcing Jesus' victory over all the forces of evil, and that now he is beginning to join together both his heavenly and his human family through his glorious church made up of Jew and Gentile. And now they are going to be joined together and the redemption that he began in the Garden of Eden is beginning to come full circle. And so it's a conquest, the voice of the archangel. There's a third thing. In verse 16, it says, and also, Christ himself will descend with the trump of God. So the, the, the shout was a command. The voice of the archangel, that is a announcement of conquest. The third, the trump of God is a call. It's interesting that 1 Corinthians 15, the great resurrection chapter, and uh, in verse... Uh, 52, He's, he talks about this very resurrection and rapture, and I want to read these verses to you real quickly. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now remember, a mystery in the Bible is truth that God has not revealed until this point. So here is the wonderful revealing 
of the of the resurrection and the rapture of the church will all be changed he says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at notice this the last trump for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised and we that is the living believers will be changed the first time it's ever revealed is in that uh, those two verses of first corinthians chapter 15 but i wanted to call your attention to the fact that he talks about the trump <laughs> same thing that he says in in first thessalonians 4 the trump he calls it the last trump and i here's here's my view on this <laughs> And look, I could be wrong, but here's my view. I think what he's saying is that this resurrection and rapture of the church is the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Do you remember the Feast of Pentecost was the birthday of the church? I think that the trump here is a reference to the Feast of Trumpets to this very day, when they, they call it Rosh Hashanah today, by the way, they don't call it the Feast of Trumpets. But as it is given in Leviticus chapter 23, and as it's practiced today, they do blow the shofar. They do blow the trumpets on, uh, on Rosh Hashanah or on the, the Feast of Trumpets. They have a series of short blasts on the ram's horn on the trumpet and then they end with a long blast. It's called the Takia Gedola. It's to the Jews, the great and the last trump. And Judaism connects that last long blast with the resurrection of the dead, which I don't think is a, a coincidence at all. And so I'm convinced personally, you don't have to accept my interpretation, but I'm convinced personally that the rapture is the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Because the Feast of Trumpets is really about the second coming of Jesus. If you look at the feast prophetically, four of them, the spring feast, four of them have already been fulfilled. And they all pertain to Jesus. The last three still remain to be fulfilled. There's a time between the fulfillment of the last three prophetically, but the first one of the last three will be the Feast of Trumpets, and I think that's the second coming, which the rapture fits into. And we'll tell you more. I hope you stay tuned and stay for the PM Bible study because I'm going to make it, uh, I'm going into greater detail and, but it's going to clarify things for you, and you're going to see the difference between the rapture and the second coming, because there's a difference that you have to get, or you'll misunderstand the Bible prophetically. So there is uh, right here the return, and then look at the next uh, thing that happens in verse 16. When the trump of God sounds, when the voice of the archangel is heard, when the shout to, uh, in the, uh, from heaven is heard, it says the dead in Christ will rise first. That's exactly what we said a moment ago when we read in verse 15 that we which are alive and remain will not precede them which are asleep. Why? Because verse 16 says the dead in Christ will rise first. They get the priority. As far as resurrection is concerned, they get the priority. Before living believers are translated, are raptured to meet the Lord in the air, before we go to Jesus, Jesus, when he returns, he will, first of all, resurrect believers that have died in Christ out from among the rest of the dead. He will transform their bodies into resurrection bodies that are like his glorious body. That's what the Bible says. When Jesus returns, note this, he's going to return 
and he's going to appear in the atmospheric heavens, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. He's going to appear in the atmospheric heavens in the clouds. Did you know in the book of Psalms, for example, Psalm 104, I think in verse 3, it says that the clouds of heaven are God's chariots, like he rides on them. They carry him. So this identifies Jesus as the God of heaven who's coming back himself. He's coming back and he's going to appear in the clouds. And simultaneous, believers' bodies will be resurrected out of the dead and uh, their bodies will be transformed into resurrection bodies like unto Jesus' glorious resurrection body. But also note this. It says that uh, when he comes, he's going to bring them with him. You see that in verse 14? When Jesus comes again, them also with sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Wait a minute. What does that mean? Remember I said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord? So when Jesus comes back and appears in the clouds in the air, he is bringing back with him the spirits and souls of those believers in Jesus. And when he resurrects them, as we read there in verse 16, the dead in Christ shall rise first. He is going to join their soul and spirit with a new resurrection body. Is that clear? That makes sense? That's what it means. That's what's going to happen. That's the resurrection. And uh, there's only going to be a split second sep uh, separating the resurrection of these dead believers with the rapture of living believers. And we get that from 1 Corinthians 15, 52. He says in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, we will all be changed. So there's only a split second between the dead in Christ being resurrected and meeting the Lord in the air, their spirit and soul being joined to their new resurrection body, and us who are alive being at that moment, our bodies transformed into his glory, like his unto his glorious body, and meeting them in the air. And that brings me to the point about the rapture here. Verse 17, notice, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That is, with the dead in Christ that rose first, will be joined with them. The, the resurrection before living believers are translated from their mortal bodies into immortal bodies, and it all happens simultaneous when they are caught up. See the words caught up there? It's uh, the original word is a word that means to forcefully snatch up or suddenly and quickly take away. That's what the words caught up means. And it's a future tense, and it's a passive tense. In other words, it's not you doing it to yourself. It's the Lord doing it to you sometime in the future. The word rapture isn't in the Bible. You say, where does it come from? Did you know that for a thousand years, the Latin Vulgate translation of the scriptures was the only Bible the church had for a thousand years? And the Latin word for those two words caught up is rapturo. And rapturo means to seize and to carry off. And so that's where the word rapture comes from. It comes from the Latin translation of the scripture, which means the church will be seized and will be carried off, will be raptured will be forcefully snatched up, be sudden, it'll be quick. What for? Look at verse 13, uh, 17 again. To meet the Lord in the air. That's why we'll be raptured. To meet the Lord in the atmosphere. To meet the Lord in the air. I heard uh, something humorous 
when I was studying for this, I came across a true illustration uh, that one of the commentators mentioned that one summer in the summer at a Christian summer camp, the camp staff staged a, an elaborate rapture while the director of the camp was not on the campgrounds. And when he returned, everyone was missing. There was clothing on the ground <laughs> as though people had just passed through their clothing. They had put, uh, they put a motorboat doing circles with no one in it in the middle of the lake there at the camp. And everything in the kitchen was functioning without any cook. And a carefully timed phone call from the town. Hey, what, what's happened? Everybody's missing over here. And only adding to the, to the effect of it, later the director admitted, you know, it really shook me for a few minutes. Well, just think of what effect, just think what effect it might have on this lost world. I wonder, I wonder how they'll explain it when literally millions of people, perhaps a billion, all of a sudden vanish from this earth in what we read about here that we call the rapture. I wonder what kind of effect that's going to have on this planet and what the explanation will be. Well, if you'll note again, it says in verse 17 that Jesus is going to return. There's going to be a resurrection of the, the dead in Christ. There's going to be a rapture of the living and the dead. And then there's going to be a reunion. See that? It says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And notice the, it's a, it's a twofold family reunion, if I can call it that. First of all, it's a reunion of the church family. I mean, both groups, the dead in Christ and the living when, when Christ comes, both groups are reunited together loved ones, and the complete church of all time from all over the earth during the entire church age are for the first time meeting one another. Now, the church age has gone on for about 2,000 years already. All believers during the church age will have a reunion. will meet one another for the first time there in the, in the clouds, in the air. But the second part of this family reunion is we'll see Jesus. We'll meet him. For the first time, we'll see him face to face. Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to come back for his people. He's going to come back for his church. He, he called them his bride. He's going to come back and he's going to claim his bride as the bridegroom. And he's going to take us to heaven, we are told here. We'll ever be with the Lord. He's going to take us to be with himself. And we'll never ever again be separated from his direct presence. Well, look at the comforts that that gives. He says in verse 18, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Remember, the church in Thessalonia was suffering persecution. I don't know, maybe someone in their church had even been martyred. Well, the rapture truth, this resurrection and rapture truth certainly was a joyful prospect when they understood it. They were encouraged by the fact that not only was Jesus going to return, but uh, he could return at any time, and he would bring them himself to unite them together with all of their brothers and sisters in the Lord, even those who had died prior to his return. But remember this. If you have a part in what is described here as what we call the rapture, if you will have a part in this, it all comes down to this point, and that is that you have a personal saving relationship with Jesus. That you are born again. 
that you are totally depending upon Jesus for forgiveness of sin, for salvation, that you have received him as your personal savior. That's what it comes down to. Otherwise, you'll be left behind. You won't have a part in this that is called the rapture. It won't be a joke like it was for the director of the summer camp. It'll be reality. And so you need a personal relationship with Jesus. I want to ask you honestly in your heart and mind, is the thought of Jesus returning at any moment exciting to you and precious to you? Or is it dreadful to you? By that, I mean, if it happened right now, and it could, it could happen at any time. And if it happened right now, are you ready? Would you be ready? You know, it's tax season, right? I hate this time. <laughs> I don't like tax season. And it's been said, there's two things nobody can escape, death and taxes. Well, that's not totally true, is it? You can escape death. We just heard about there's some believers that will escape death. I don't know if anyone could escape taxes. Only through death, I guess, right? Well, death is a fact of life. And the only way that a Christian can escape death is by the rapture. Death is not an accident. Death is an appointment. No matter how a person dies, it's not an accident. It is an appointment because the Bible says it is appointed unto men once to die. And so death is an appointment. So are you ready for your appointment? Are you ready for death? My wife and I were in England uh, quite a few years ago now. We visited some cemeteries. One particular cemetery, there was this on the tombstone. Pause, my friend, as you walk by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you will be. Prepare, my friend, to follow me. Someone replied to that tombstone who was living and said, well, to follow you is not my intent till I know which way you went. <laughs> that is true. It's true, it's, right? It's true. It's true, though. Death isn't the end of your existence. Even if you're not a believer... Death is not the end of your existence. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. To perish means to spend an eternity in conscious suffering in hell. So death isn't the end of existence. But Christians, as we've seen just briefly this morning, have tremendous assurance we have tremendous hope because death and the return of Christ is real. And so we have all the hope and more. But the question is, where are you heading? Where are you going? Who are you following?